And okay, welcome to uh, an annual version, a bit of a strange annual version of our yearly Professor's Ice Wall. Uh, I think we've been doing this for about five years now, uh, or at least I remember it for the past five years. Um, so everyone from the uh, representatives from our analytical facilities on campus and the various members of the Earth and Environmental Sciences faculty are gonna take it in turn. We have a three minute overview of their uh, research activities and uh, hopefully provide anyone who's unfamiliar with the department a chance to get better acquainted with it. So uh, we're gonna turn it over to each of the uh, speakers in turn for a three minute presentation. We do ask you to keep it hopefully um, as close to that three minutes as possible. Uh, we'll probably give you 10 or 15 seconds over, but we do have to keep things moving. So uh, in the interest of time, we'll get started. Our first speaker is Paul Middlestead for the Janvisor Stable Ice Depth Lab. So, uh, Paul, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, we can get things started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Um, and I will give you a quick overview of the Janvisor Lab. Since I only have uh, uh, three minutes, I better I better start going. All right. So. Um, we are the best uh, stable isotope lab at uh, U of O. Uh, that goes uh, without saying, we are the only lab at U of O. Um, what is it? What is a stable isotope? Well, uh, these are naturally occurring elements with different masses uh, due to different uh, uh, neutrons. As an example, we can have uh, carbon 12, which is made of six proton and six neutron, and carbon 13, which is made of six proton and uh, seven neutron. These do not decay into other elements, hence we call them stable. Um, in this case, uh, we would measure the ratio of carbon 13 to carbon 12 in a sample. This would tell us, in this case again, if the carbon is of origin, is, is of organic or inorganic origin. Um, FYI, the unstable isotopes uh, are called the radioactive or radiogenics, and these typically decay into other elements, such as carbon 13 decaying into nitrogen 15. And these can be used as tracers and as dating tools. These are, these are the ones that we do not do here. Um, but the AMS group uh, specializes in that, of course. Um, so we do uh, sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. This uh, picture here shows all the fields that we touch in earth and, uh, and environmental sciences. I'm sure that you will find a, a bubble in here that applies it to you. And so we do uh, um, thermometry, we use uh, tracers, reaction mechanism, chemostratigraphy, and more. Um, we used to be called the GG Hatch Lab and we are now the Yan Visor Lab, and we, uh, you can reach us at this address here. Um, and if you go to that address, th the first thing you see is this beautiful picture. This is uh, Yan Visor, his lovely wife, the Dean, Ian Clark, myself, and Isam al -Assam, which was one of the first grad students of uh, uh, Yan. So once you're on our website, you go to sample submission and you download this Excel spreadsheet where we are asking some info about you and uh, how you're going to pay. And of course, a list of your samples here, including as much information possible that you can give us on your samples. There is a cell here numeric media code and in this cell one would write the type of analysis that one would like to have and these analysis are listed in this media tab 
So if we click on the media tab, we get this. We have all these analysis that we offer. We offer almost 80 analysis, in fact. Um, on water alone, one could do, say, six different analysis. Hence, it's critical that you specifically indicate the one that you would like to have. So this first block here is all water. So everything we can do to a water sample, including dissolved gases in the water. And then this block here, we do a percent of uh, solids. And in this block here, we do um, stable isotopes of organics. This block here is inorganic uh, carbonates, so carbon and oxygen isotopes. And we move to the other page where we do the inorganic isotopes of uh, all these things are offered. And finally, we do gases of and all kind of isotopes on, on gases. Um, so we actually offer a lot. Can we offer even a little bit more, such as a micro drill to drill fine features in uh, minerals or growth uh, rings. We also have a ball mill for difficult uh, samples. And we offer elemental analysis for percent um, of uh, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, sulfur, and then oxygen in another analysis. We also offer uh, GC work uh, where we can give you the, co the concentration of nitrogen, oxygen, methane, CO, CO2, and C2 to C5 alkanes in a gas. And if we don't offer it, uh, give us a shout. Maybe we can still do it. Okay. One last thing that, that we offer is a scholarship. And uh, this is unfortunately uh, limited to uh, students that have gone through the Ontario system. And I must admit this year, this award was, was not given. We had no candidates at all. So we Sorry, were... Paul, uh, we got to move on now. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, so we'll, uh, if anybody wants to catch up with Paul, we'll uh, okay. go ahead and email sorry. him after the presentations. Um, next up, we have Glenn Poirier with the SEM and Probe Lab. Um, so Glenn, if you can go ahead and share, share your screen. Hi, I'm Glenn Poirier, and this is, uh, I'm in the ARC 150 ARC lab in a special custom built electron microscopy lab. Uh, apologize for the slideshow. I went up to five minutes, up to 30 minutes ago, I was going to carry a camera around the lab, but I realized that's not going to work. So anyway, uh, so here's a picture of the lab and you can see the main two instruments in here. We're in ele micro, uh, an electron microanalysis lab, x-ray microanalysis, and we mainly deal with getting uh, mi with microscopy and doing x-ray chemistry of small phases. Um, so the main instrument most students work with is this Joel 6610 LV electron microscope. And this is a hands-on lab. If you come and work, if you want something done with the lab, you're probably going to come and do it yourself because I don't have time to do it for you. So it's mainly hands-on. You're going to come and learn how to use the electron microscope and, and look at your own samples. Uh, what do we want? What do we use with the 6610 LV for? Mainly, it's a super powerful microscope uh, that, has, that can identify minerals for you. So... Typically, we work in backscatter mode, and so backscatter mode lets us see the different phases very easily. This is a piece of a meteorite, and you can easily see the difference between the super bright phases, which are iron metal, the dark phases, which are meteoritic glass, and then the olivine and clinopyroxene phases as well. So really good for picking up mineral textures. Uh, this is a polished thin section, by the way. But what it's also really good for is doing mineral ID using X-ray analysis. So you hit minerals with an X-ray beam, and, or an electron beam and they produce x-rays. Uh, so this is a, a spectrum of the very bright phase we found in the middle of these uh, of this chlorite and, and uh, mica from Cambodia. And the x-ray analysis shows it's got a lot of phosphorus, uranium, and rare earths. So it's a monazite. So really good for identifying weird minerals and, and uh, 
and getting images of them. Uh, it's also got some really interesting modes for looking at samples you don't traditionally put in an electron microscope. This, for example, is the head of a monarch butterfly that I just picked up off the sidewalk and threw it in the microscope. And normally when you fire an electron beam at things, they'll charge up and you won't be able to see it. But we have special modes where we can look at non-conductive uh, samples easily. So looking at things like this or things from a museum that I can't easily do sample prep on. And finally, just quick, this is all very quick. We have a cathode luminescence uh, detector in there. So this is really important for things like zircons. If you look in the upper left, that's a picture of a zircon in backscatter mode, and it looks pretty uniform. But if we look at that, with the light produced from electrons hitting that sample, we can see there's a very prominent core in that zircon. And it's really important when you're doing zircon age dating. All right, so very quick uh, explanation of the electron microscope. The main instrument I work with in the lab is the JOL 8230 electron microprobe. And it's essentially a scanning electron microscope, like 6610, but it's designed from the ground up to get very high quality analyses of very small areas, in some cases down to uh, one square micron in diameter. And the big difference are these spectrometers you can see sticking out of the side of the middle of the column. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but these things here, these are x-ray spectrometers and they're designed to give very precise and very accurate analyses of x-rays produced by minerals. Okay. And just a quick one. I won't go through that much. Just shows you the detectors uh, and very typical work. This is again, something from our work in Cambodia on the low, on the right here, you can see a cross section through some mica and you can see parts of that mica are very bright and parts that are very dark. And that's a function of the amount of iron in that mica. And we did some point analysis of these using points that are about uh, 10 microns. So about a 10th of that scale there. And we analyzed a whole bunch of different micros and we can see that there's a very, very strong correlation between the amount of fluorite and the amount of iron in these micas. And so this is really typical work. And these, the precision of these analyses is on the order of 1%, which is, so that's the main bread and butter of our lab is doing stuff like this. If you do a I'm couple of hundred uh, thousand analyses, wrap up, Glenn. am I done already? <laughs> just, yeah, sorry. Okay, but no problem. Take two seconds to wrap up. And... Yeah, this is a couple of hundred thousand analyses of a piece of galena, and we can put that together in an image and we can see that in that galena, we have zoning of silver and it's quantified. So we can go from zero silver to five and a half percent silver in that sample. Uh, so anyway, come and see me if you have any questions. Um, uh, we're on, the, we're on the, the department website. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Uh, next up is Numal Da Silva for the Geochem Lab. Uh, so Numal, if you want to share your screen, please go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to speak a few words about our lab. Um, okay, our location, room 435, Advanced Research Complex. Um, we have the people working here, myself and Smita Mohanty and uh, Lace Ablation ICPMS manager, Dr. Samuel Mofren, and our lab directors, uh, Professor Tom Mell and Professor Jonathan Nolin. So mainly our activities, uh, uh, providing services on elemental analysis and measurement of anions in aqueous media. But uh, it, doesn't not, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are doing simply as a cheap alternative to the commercial lab. We always develop method dedicated to specific research needs of our researchers here and provide advice, consultation on the analytical aspects of research projects. And also we do novel research and development for improving analytical techniques, instrumentation and data quality, limit of detection and so on. Also, we use it as an educational training facility if someone's, someone is interested in learning more about these our techniques that we use. Our clients, uh, researchers within the mainly the earth sciences and uh, the environmental sciences. Also, we cater other faculties at the University of Ottawa, engineering, biology, chemistry, etc., as a co-facility. 
and also we have clients from external academia, government, industry, and international collaborators. Our analytical capabilities, uh, we can do elemental concentration at part uh, from percent level to parts per trillion PPT level in rocks, sediments, waters, biological, industrial material, etc. And also we measure anions in aqueous uh, media at uh, sub PPM level. How we do it, um, basically it based on our, our uh, measurements on atomic spectroscopic technique. Regardless of what the physical state of the material, for example, if it is solid uh, sample or to do atomic spectroscopy, you have to finally get down to free atoms. To, if it is a solid material, we have to go through several steps of processing. So first step is the dissolution sample dissolution. To do the sample dissolution, we convert this solid to liquid using, the, the, if it is already a complex liquid, we may simple, do a simple dilution or acid digestion using hot plate microwave digestion. We have two microwave digestion systems. Then. The next step is once you get this liquid into a gaseous phase as a kind of an aerosol, how do we do that? We mimic the nature. We use a nebulizer to spray the liquid into a spray chamber, then that carries that is carried to the plasma. So now once we have this aerosol, then we have to create free atoms. To do the free to create free atoms, we use something called inductive recoupled plasma. Basically it is hot ionized argon gas. We introduce the sample through here, from the button, through the central tube. This is a typical picture of the ICP. ICP temperature profiles, it can reach 10,000, 15,000 degrees, depending on applied direct power. Typically plasmas are considered as hottest man-made objects. So uh, when these aerosol droplets get into the plasma, they undergo almost instantaneous evaporation, excitation, and atom atomization. Sorry, Namal, about shows, 30 seconds to wrap up. Uh, this is the process of, uh, the, we measure op by optical emission spectrometry. Uh, we measure the light emitted and the mass spectrometry, we measure the ions. So we have a few mass spectrometers, mass spectrometers, Cordopol 8800, thermo instrument element XR, and the laser ablation system. And also we have several ICP emission spectrometer systems. And we also do ion chromatography using Dionex based on the retention time of these ions. And these are the kind of research and development projects we are doing, new sample introduction techniques, develop customized analytical, analytical method, ID in generation, direct powder introduction, pre-concentration of trace elements, and uh, chemometric, that is the uh, mathematical approaches for improving data quality and instrument calibration. And also we are doing a novel uh, cross internal standardization using analyze themselves as internal standards. So these are the, uh, to uh, basically our lab area, ICP ES lab and the ICP emission lab. And if you uh, want to contact us, these are the, uh, you can, uh, my email address and Smitha and uh, Sam's uh, Thank you for your listening. Okay, thanks Namal, great. Next up we have uh, Dr. Ian Clark, who's going to give us an overview of the AMS facilities. Um, moving forward from here, just, um, Presenters, please keep an eye on your chat. I'll be giving you some time notifications just uh, in there so it's less obstructive. But Ian, if you can go ahead and share your uh, screen. Thanks, Taylor. How's that? You got me there? Yeah, we can see it. Great. Great. Yeah, Ian Clark. I'm on the management team of the Andre Lalande Accelerator Mass Spectrometry Laboratory. And uh, this is a national facility for uh, AMS research, and uh, we emphasize radiocarbon. We do a lot of that. <clears throat> so uh, any of you uh, undergraduates who might have a, a need for this type of work in your thesis, or even just to come over and see what's going on, that's what we're going to have a look at here. 
there is the accelerator. And uh, this uh, instrument is big because we're trying to analyze very trace concentrations of radionuclides. Now, Paul uh, explained what stable isotopes are, and he mentioned that there are radioisotopes. So we're measuring the radioisotopes, and they're always present in nature at 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 14. So these are exceedingly low concentrations, and that's why we need a big instrument to do this. Now, you might need analysis of some of these in your research, tritium as an example for um, uh, groundwater studies, uh, beryllium-10, we're, we're developing labs for that for exposure dating. And radiocarbon is the big one. Everybody loves to analyze radiocarbon for dating. Lake sediments, artifacts, processes in the Holocene and Pleistocene. Uh, we're also using it as an environmental tracer to, for things like biodegradation in soil. So a lot of environmental uses as well as we go right up to uh, uranium and plutonium for various studies up there. So uh, the, the range of isotopes that we can analyze is somewhat limited by uh, the, uh, not just the accelerator, but what we're looking at here is the entire list uh, on, the, on the, the floor graphic in our AMS hall shows all the radionuclides that exist, but we're analyzing just a small subset which have particular interest for uh, the uh, earth sciences. Now, if you guys uh, and uh, you know undergraduates are interested in doing some work there for your thesis, you might be working in the radiocarbon lab and you can come up and prepare your own samples. Uh, we have to take samples and convert them to CO2 and then we convert them to graphite and we, uh, we are a cool lab. Radiocarbon is a cool process. We're, we're taking uh, CO2 and converting it to graphite here for the targets for the AMS hall down, down below. We're more than just the uh, accelerator. We're also noble gases, and some of these are radiogenic noble gases. So we're the only lab in Canada as well that actually can uh, analyze uh, helium isotopes for a variety of processes. And I've got undergraduate students who are doing that work as well. So uh, keep this stuff in mind. There's our crew. Uh, actually, this is kind of an old photo. So uh, we're a little bit uh, bigger than this and uh, some, some additional faces. And I'll also just say that the lab was named as uh, in memory of Dr. Lalande. Andre Lalande was a mineralogist in our department internationally recognized. He was our Dean of Science and uh, was really responsible for building or getting built the ARC, which, uh, which, which houses the Lalonde Lab. And so he passed away in 2014, uh, 2012 and in 2014, his legacy was honored by naming the lab. So I encourage you all to come around, take a look, uh, speak to profs about the potential for using the uh, AMS for your research. And I uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Taylor. I'm done. All right. Thanks a lot, Ian. Uh, OK, so the next presenters, although Ian is a member of the faculty, uh, the next presenters will be sticking around afterwards. Uh, and if anybody, uh, undergrad or graduate, looking to talk to uh, some of the professors in more detail about their research, um, we're going to have breakout rooms set up. So just. Uh, Anybody who's interested, message the professor themselves, and then you guys can let me know. Uh, we have breakout rooms set up for each one, and uh, you can figure that out. Just let me know. So the first talk uh, that we're going to have is Dr. John O'Neill. Uh, so John, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, take things over. Uh, John, if you're talking, we can't uh, can't hear you. you. Might be on mute. <laughs> Should have caught that a little faster. So can't hear you. Is using your your AirPods?
Can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you. Great. And okay, we, I just I just switched microphones. I'm using another microphone. And can you see my screen? Yep, all good. Okay, sorry about that. So now I have 30 seconds left. Um, no, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jonathan O'Neill. I'm a geochemist, stainless petrologist, uh, isotope geochemist in the department. And my uh, research focuses on the early Earth. So I'm basically interested in understanding how the Earth form and especially how the, uh, the early mantle and the first crust and the first continent form uh, on our planet. So just to put everything in time perspective, uh, most of you, all of you will be familiar with the geological time scale from today all the way to the start of the solar system or the, uh, the birth of the Earth. And what I'm focusing on is this, this, this period here from the start of the solar system to about uh, 2.3 uh, billion years ago. So the Hadean and the uh, oldest part of the Archean, the EO Archean. And um, one of the issue or one of the challenge we have is that we don't have a lot of work to uh, rocks uh, to work with. So uh, as you know, rocks are record, uh, recording everything for us geologists. So the idea is to go back in time and try to find the oldest rocks possible to understand how they formed and how uh, the, the crust and the mantle evolved and formed at that time. And, and this is just an, an overview of basically everything older than 3.7 billion years old is on that map. So in Canada, we're pretty lucky. We have some of the oldest rocks on earth, actually the oldest rocks on earth. Uh, there are some rocks in Greenland in China in, in Australia and Africa, but not a lot to work with. So the, the, the broad uh, questions I'm trying to, to solve is, uh, has, they have to do with magma ocean crystallization, how they are uh, differentiated, and mainly how the first crust form and the formation of our oldest continents. And this is all linked to possible, the, possibly the start of plate tectonics. So all of these questions, but really uh, focusing uh, early on. And um, uh, just an example of what we can do. This is a place where I've been working for the last few years with uh, grad students in, in, in Norton, Labrador here, uh, Sagle-Gibron Complex. Uh, it is uh, granite greenstone terrain, so we do a lot of field work, sampling rocks, sampling TTGs, tonalite and granites, but also sampling uh, uh, basaltic rocks and supercrystal rocks. And I'm combining uh, geochronology, so these rocks are almost 3.9 billion years old, so almost the oldest on Earth. Uh, so combining geochronology, but also basic petrology and geochemistry to try to understand how these rocks form and their origin and how they evolved, again, to understand how the first earliest crust, uh, how it form on Earth. And then also a lot of my work is using isotope as tracers. Uh, so uh, here, I won't go into all the details, but basically we're using isotopes to try to, to trace the source of these rocks and have a better idea of how they formed. Are they from the uh, reworking and re melting of older crust or what kind of mantle they're from? Uh, so this is done with uh, some isotopes we're uh, using a lot. And uh, lastly, uh, not only old rocks uh, is, um, I'm not working only on the oldest rocks, but also in uh, younger rocks, but that may hold the uh, old signatures. So these are two examples where 2.7 billion years old ferropicrites, so iron rich uh, la lavas and 2.7 billion years old tonalites. And although uh, they're not as old as Hadean, uh, we can use isotopes to trace their, uh, their ancestry, basically, and see what was going on as their source, uh, either mantle source or crustal source, back in the Hadean uh, more than 4 billion years ago. So in a nutshell, this, this is my um, research. All right, thanks a lot, John. Uh, next up, we have David Schneider, who, uh, go ahead and share his screen. There we go. Hi everybody, thanks for coming today and hearing about the department and what's going on and all of that. I hope everybody can see everything and hear me and just let's go. So I don't know what I am. Uh, I got a lot of things going on. Uh, my students are kind of all over the map in terms of scale and size and, and all of that. Uh, and so the best way I can talk about my research is just centrally deformation of material. Um, from the lithospheric scale down to the nanometer scale. And so here's a cross-section of a subduction zone. 
showing some of the areas that I work. Uh, so I, I work basins has implications for hydrocarbon generation. Uh, I look at magmatism and other mineralization processes, which has implications for ore deposits. Uh, I'm also interested in uplift, uh, which has implications for climatology. And then more recently, I'm looking at rocks that may have something to do with earthquakes. And so that has something to do with seismic hazards. But generally, I look at a very rare piece of the sort of crustal stratigraphy that it's very hard to assess simply because uh, metamorphic equilibrium is rather tenuous and uh, structures are very overprinted easily. Uh -huh. uh, and so I talked about scale. And so I work at the kilometer scale. Two of my field areas that I've been focused on in the last few years uh, are in the Arctic region. Uh, so pretty much from uh, northern Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, Svalbard, all the way over to Northwest Territories. So this is a, a rifted margin, the Arctic margin uh, that opened as the Atlantic Ocean uh, became an ocean. Uh, and I'm also interested in another margin that has rifted uh, most recently during the Miocene. Uh, during accretion and extension of the African plate towards Greece. So uh, the Cyclades and the region between Greece and Turkey. Stepping down in scale, I'm also interested in the hectometer to decimeter scale. Uh, so here are some field shots from Greece. Uh, so we use drone images and drone mapping as well as boots on the ground to try to understand various units. Uh, that are exposed there. Uh, and then sort of looking at the, we are looking at uh, various structures that we see to try to understand the kinematics and timing of deformation. And then stepping down a scale or two or three even more, uh, my students have been looking at micrometer to nanometer scale uh, material in various types of rocks uh, where we're still looking at deformation, we're looking at dislocations, uh, stacking faults and things like that. Uh, and then at times, uh, some of these defects that we see, if we count these defects, we know these defects form because of radiogenic decay. If we count these defects, we can kind of get a chronometer or a timing of when these rocks form. So I'm interested in a variety of scales uh, from kilometer scale down to nanometer scale, simply looking at the deformation of geological material. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Dr. Glenn Milne. Might be muted, Glenn. I can't hear you. Uh, it's not on Zoom. It'd be on your end, uh, either your mic or I think John just had to switch his input. I hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we got you. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. It's the uh, same old problem. No worries. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep, you're good. Take it away. Okay. Okay, folks, uh, thanks for showing up. Thanks to Taylor and the team for putting this on, organizing it. So yeah, just quickly, so my group is very much involved in computer modeling. So we're kind of the physics computer nerds in the department. So essentially this, this is, uh, let me just put my laser pointer on there. Um, so this slide on the left is one of our computers. So this is a parallel computer. For those of you that have been in the Marion basement next to Dave's office, you hear, if you go past that door, you hear a lot of fans going. So this is a cool room. So it houses a bunch of computers. It's kind of the university's research computer room. We have a couple of these, uh, what they call parallel computers in there. So we have a lot of computing power. We run simulations of basically changes in ice sheet, sea level, land motion, gravity, and earth rotation through, through these supercomputers, these parallel computers. And our goal is to really 
develop models and test them against observations of things like sea level, land motion, both in the past and the present, and then to use those models to predict future changes in the climate system. So we don't do the complete climate system, we really focus on ice sheets, solid earth and sea level. And again, the main goal is to understand the underlying processes that drive changes in ice sheets and sea level over different time scales, and, and really dig into the physics of these problems. So that's, this is kind of our virtual lab, if you like. So we're really computer nerds, as I say. So the, you know, all, all research, research is driven by questions. So the main questions, this is an, an example of some of the questions we try to address in our research. So how sensitive are the two major ice sheets to, to climate change, both in the past and then going forward into the future? What processes dominate sea level change in different areas? Like sea level change is not like filling a bathtub with water, as I'll show on a slide in a minute. So it's a bit more complicated than that. So we try and understand the processes that dominate in different areas. And obviously, the, the million dollar question that we all want to know is how much will sea levels rise in a given location by a certain time? You know, if you're trying to estimate the hazard due to climate change and sea level rise, that's a, these are questions that come up all the time. So our research kind of plugs directly into that question. Also, it's not all about climate and you know sea level. We also a lot of our research also tells us about the solid earth, in particular, the viscosity of the earth's mantle. So that's an important uh, thing to know if you're trying to understand mantle convection and plate tectonics, right? So it's not just climate and surface, it's also deep earth interior. Just a few quick slides or pictures of mod, typical model output from some of the simulations we run. So this is this is an example of the Greenland ice sheet. We're simulating it over like the last 100,000 years. These are just four time steps of the more recent part of that period. So up here, we're looking at about 16,000 years ago, then 12,000, 8,000, then 4,000. So basically the big, nice, healthy ice sheet kind of in the last glacial period. Then it basically shrank due to climate warming as we come into the Holocene, the warm period. And it actually got smaller than it is today, about 4,000 years ago and then regrew to, to roughly where it is now. But now it's starting to lose mass again due to contemporary warming of the system. Now you might say, well, who cares about that? That's the past. But if you want to predict the future, you have to know the, the ice sheet has a memory to past temperature change and climate. That's kind of embedded in the temperature structure in the ice sheet today. And that affects how it will flow and evolve in the future, regardless of the climate forcing. So in order to predict the future, you have to have good models of how the ice sheet evolved in the past. And so that's kind of where our research fits in. Another aspect of the thing we do is future sea level change at global to regional scale. So this is just a prediction of sea level change if you melt the Greenland ice sheet. So let's say we take a model of how the ice sheet evolves in the next 100 years. Let's say that, that, that these models tell us that Greenland ice sheet will, use an equivalent, will lose an equivalent of 10 centimeters of sea level rise in 100 years. So basically, you take that 10 centimeters and you multiply it by these numbers on the bottom. So this is what we call the sea level fingerprint. How does sea level change when you melt an ice sheet? Well, this is basically showing that in the gray areas, you actually see a sea level fall. Yeah, you, you melt the ice, but you see a sea level fall due to gravitational and solid earth feedbacks. So if you live in Nova, uh, Newfoundland or Nova Scotia, you see no sea level rise whatsoever. You're exactly on the zero contour. All right, glad However, to if you live down in South America, you see a rise that's uh, you know, 130%, 140% of the actual melting on the ice sheet. So there's a, this very distinct spatial pattern that, that re relates to the physical processes involved. Finally, some of the, uh, another set of work we've been doing, maybe some of you guys saw the ice one I gave a little while ago on this, but we look at land motion in New Orleans. Uh, so this area down on the Gulf Coast is the sea level rise down here is like four to five times the global average because the land is sinking. So the question is, why is the land sinking? Some of the ideas is due to the isostatic subsidence due to the sediment loading. So we kind of looked at that and it turns out that's not what's causing this excess sea level rise. The sediment loading only adds less than a millimeter per year to the to sea level rise. So this is kind of subsidence rates you get from sediment loading. So the actual process is driving the subsidence here is compaction of the sediments. That's the dominant process. So yeah, hey, Glenn, just a few seconds to wrap up. Okay, uh, and just final slide to say that we're not, all, we're not always sitting in our caves on computers. We do get out and about from time to time and we participate in field work that links into our research projects, whether that's in French Polynesia looking at corals, 
GPS networks in Scandinavia, this is a permanent GPS site in Sweden, are taking cores and lakes in Greenland to get paleo sea level records. So we do get out and about, and I've had students that have been to all of these places as part of their, 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 their research. Okay, thanks, sorry for going over time. Oh, it's all good, thanks Glenn. Uh, next up we have Dr. Keiko Hattori. Keiko, you're still muted if, uh, if you're talking. Can you see that uh, my... Oh, we can hear you, but we can't see your screen yet. Share screen. Okay. Oh, no. Can you see that screen? Still not yet. There we go. Yeah, can you see the screen now? Uh, yes, we see your desktop then. Okay, there's your PowerPoint. Yep, you're good. Thank you. Uh, sorry that um, uh, my interest is subduction zones and uh, where arc magmas produce uh, lots of volcanoes and also many mineral deposits, like copper of copper and many gold deposits. Uh, volcano keep discharging volatiles and also magma. That meaning is that some supply of volatiles to this uh, source area. Otherwise, uh, this volcano will be totally dried up. So, um, so slabs, subducting slabs transfer volatile da, 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 and the metals from the surface to their mantle area, and uh, they are returning to the surface through volcanoes. Um, so how those volatiles are uh, transferred to the mantle? Uh, so uh, hydrous minerals, or even nominally unhydrous minerals like origin pyroxene, can contain significant amount of volatiles like water, rain, bone, Nitrogen. Therefore, where dehydration, decrystallization can transfer uh, the volatiles into a mantle um, Because composition of slabs are different, and also configuration of subduction zones are different, meaning the temperature is different at a given um, depth. Therefore, a product produced um, uh, sort of a partial melting of arc magmas are very different from one arc uh, one subduction zone to the other. For example, just to look at oxidation condition, arc magma show very large, three orders of magnitude different in that uh, ox oxidation condition. When oxidation conditions are different, then redox um, uh, sensitive elements like sulfur ion, vanadium, they change speciation. For example, especially sulfur. Sulfur is a highly soluble as a sulfate in oxidized magma. This is the reason some of those volcanoes, like Pinatubo and also Central America, they can discharge, or they can bring large amount of sulfur to upper class, discharging huge amount of sulfur into the atmosphere. Because also compositions are different, meaning is that also metals and diamonds are different. How so they are transferred from mantle to upper class to upper class. Uh, this is a big set of compilation. As you can see, very well known subduction zone like Japan. On New Zealand, they don't have any fossil copper deposits. On the other hand, Central South America contain uh, many fossil large fossil copper deposits. So, uh, so what are the um, uh, there are list of several my research questions. 
as I said, as I mentioned, the large spell of recycling going down and coming up to the volcano. And how those volatiles enter into a deep mountain? What the minerals are transporting is volatiles like water. And uh, also that um, what condition make some subduction or some area very metabolic and the surface. Uh, and how why are some ducks in long and arcs are very little fruit? And also that the not only that the large scale recycling, some small, small scale recycling, and how volatile the metals are concentrated within a cluster. And some are probably contributed from monkey. Those are my research uh, questions. So, Thank you very much. If any questions, you can contact me and perhaps you can do to my website. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Keiko. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Clema Bataille. Okay. I cannot share my screen for now Here. because Keiko is still sharing. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Should be all good. I, yeah, so it's, it's all good. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. So no technical issue. Let me put the. Okay. So thank you very much for organizing this uh, ice one to uh, all the grad students who organized that. Thank you so much, and welcome to uh, all the people in the department, particularly the undergrads. This is specifically tailored for you guys for uh, looking at possible honor project in the future. And so I'm Clément Bataille. I am the head of the SAVE lab. Uh, the SAVE uh, comes from uh, spatial temporal analytic of isotope variation in the environment. And so this, this quick presentation is going to be about you know, what do we do at the SAVE lab. But if you want, you can also check uh, my website, or our group website, uh, that gives kind of information, uh, much more detailed information about the project that my different students are working on and the different things we do uh, in our group. So I'm going to try to do that very quickly through two examples. Um, and a lot of the people in my group work on using isotope for provenancing animal, people, uh, and, and materials. And so here's an example of how I've been doing this. This is a project I've been involved with some students uh, recently. Uh, so you know possibly that there is a, a megafauna left over in permafrost in the north, in particular in Alaska. So this is a task we found in uh, uh, the North Slope in Alaska. And what we did is what we measured the isotopes uh, temporally along the task here. So what is this is recording is a temporal series basically of a bunch of isotopes that tells you how this isotope varied in these animals through time during his life. Uh, and what's nice about isotope is that we can predict uh, very well how those isotopes vary in their environment. And so this is what the sort of models that we uh, develop in our group that's called isoscape that showed how isotope in this case vary uh, in rocks across Alaska. And what you can do next is you compare the value that you find in this task with the value you find in your map of isotope. And you can say something about, for example, in this case, where these individual mammoths were moving, what he was doing, what he was eating, uh, was he interacting with human being at that time or things like this. So you can see there's implication here for uh, paleoecology, extinction of mammoths, um, question of mammoth interaction with humans. Uh, and my group works in a lot of different animals in this case. So I work with uh, ancient horses. Uh, some of my students work with uh, migratory butterflies, with uh, humans as well. So ancient humans in archaeological times, uh, but also modern humans for resolving some cold cases. So there's all sort of research question here to apply isotopes uh, uh, to try to understand the provenance of individuals uh, for all sorts of fields. Another uh, team theme that uh, we work on in my group is using isotope this time for tracing solids sources in river water. So it's a bit of the same story here, except instead of using animal tissues, we're using water. And so what we do, we go in the field, and in this case here in the Yukon River, we go and sample a bunch of, of river water across this uh, watersheds, and we measure isotopes uh, that can be metal isotope, that can be regular stable isotope, as we've seen in our different labs. But again, we're using some sort of spatial statistics, some GIS work, uh, some data science to try to model how those isotopes vary in their environment. If, if we can try to understand the control of those isotope variation. And that tells us something about 
uh, water quality, the interaction of climate with the geosphere and how you know weathering is changing uh, in a changing climate, for example. He tell us something at the global scale about paleo environment, about uh, paleo biogeochemical cycles and how uh, the earth function in the past. And so we answer all these sort of question in my group using this, uh, this isotopes. And so you understand there that at the same lab, what we do is that we use two different pools, basically isotope geochemistry, which with all sort of different techniques and data science and spatial statistics to basically develop some innovative applications uh, in environmental science, tracing the solving question in the hydrosphere, solving question for the geosphere, uh, for, the, for the biosphere. Uh, so there is not any limits in terms of uh, actual science question. We do all sorts of things, uh, but we, the, the common theme here is that we work together on these different uh, techniques. And so here, I uh, just wanted to mention that we also have a group. Uh, it's not only about science, also about fun sometimes. Uh, we try to do a, a group meeting regularly. We try to see uh, each other regularly as well to uh, kind of develop soft skills and uh, develop other techniques and just uh, the science part. And that's it. That's what uh, we do in our group. Thank you, Clement. Uh, up next, we have Dr. Mark Hannington. All right. Got my screen? Yeah, we got it. All right, so uh, thank you for that. My name is Mark Hannington. Uh, I'm an economic geologist, uh, kind of like Keiko, but, but not quite uh, for a number of reasons. I'm also the director of the new uh, NSERC CREATE program in uh, marine geodynamics and georesources. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the NSERC CREATE program, it's really NSERC's main vehicle for professional training uh, in the scientists at the at, in the sciences at the at the graduate level, uh, the program that we have is called marine geo uh, marine geodynamics and geo resources, and it's a bit of a mix. Why are we interested in geo resources? Uh, in a couple of years, uh, electric cars are going to need about four times as much copper as we have in conventional cars today, for example. Um, and soon we're going to need to find the critical metals that we need for batteries and windmills and solar panels to create the green electricity that we're going to need for those cars. Uh, the geodynamics component of the program is that we need to access those, we are going to need to access those resources at much greater depth in the crust. And this demands a better understanding of uh, the deep structure and the composition of the crust, as well as, uh, in particular, uh, plate tectonics is a fundamental driver for where ore deposits occur. And why in the oceans? Well, the modern plate tectonics is something that we use as an analog for understanding the, the formation of ancient crust and its resources. And most of the plate boundaries in the modern ocean and the modern uh, world are, are in the oceans. And so we're studying plate tectonics primarily in the oceans. This is a big task and it requires big teams and big international partners. And we have a number of these partners that we uh, that help us with access to ship time, for example, for doing large scale marine geophysical surveys in areas of plate plate boundaries. The team that we have in Ottawa and we share also with our German partners is working on one aspect of the of this program, which is to create the first geological maps of the oceans at scales that we can directly compare with ancient terrains. And so everyone in the team is actually working on high resolution tectonostratigraphic compilations in the oceans. This is an example from the uh, east, one of our projects in easternmost Papua New Guinea. And the, motiv the motivation for this is kind of simple. Our, our understanding of tectonic processes, for example, in greenstone belts, where a lot of mineral resources occur, is strongly influenced by comparisons with modern analogs. But the quality of those comparisons is, is only as good as the geological maps that we have, particularly in the oceans. And for the most part, most of the, the oceans uh, don't have geological maps. And that's what we're trying to change uh, in our program. The CREATE is aimed at providing some of the training that's needed to do that. So we're trying to get students on ships to get experiences in actual marine expeditions and then to use that knowledge for uh, training on land. And then eventually we hope that every student will get a chance to go to sea and apply that knowledge. We're also developing models of geodynamics to understand crustal growth. And we're working on land-based mineral deposits directly uh, to understand how tectonic influences control the distribution of resources. So that's the CREATE program. Right now we have 20 master students 
and PhD students in the program and 16 affiliated students. And uh, this includes from, uh, students from in the department. Uh, those of you who know David Dekrup, he's the program manager and the person uh, to talk to if you're interested in getting involved in this program. We're in year one of six years, so we're just getting started. And you can stay tuned for uh, course announcements, for field schools and field trip announcements, and exchange opportunities that will be presented on our, on our website. Okay, thanks very much for that. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, up next, we have Dr. Danielle Fortin. And we got your screen, so. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so my name is Danielle Fortin. I'm a geomicrobiologist in the, in the department. So what is geomicrobiology? You might wonder. It's, um, it's a science that looks at the interactions between bacteria, minerals, rocks, and water. So it's right at the interface between low temperature geochemistry and microbiology. Why do we care about this? Well, it's very important because there are many, many types of bacteria out there that play a very important role in the um, redox transformation of some contaminants that are highly toxic. For instance, they can uh, some bacteria can reduce uranium, or chromium, or arsenic. And what it does is it affects the solubility of those minerals. Some bacteria can create new minerals, and some bacteria can actually reduce them and make them more soluble and more mobile in the environment. So my group has been focusing on natural biogenic iron oxides. We call them bios. Um, so why? Because iron is the fourth most abundant element of the planet but also because iron oxides form naturally in the environment because of the activity of certain bacteria. So at the top of my screen here, you can see an iridescent film. This was a picture taken at Mont Tremblant, I believe. So what you see here is not gasoline being spilled on water. It's actually a biofilm of neutrophilic iron oxidizing bacteria that are capable of um, competing with oxygen and they oxidize ferrous iron to ferric iron in the the result is a mixture of bacteria and iron oxide. So what you see the material, the iridescent material is actually the exopolysaccharide secreted by the bacteria. And there are two images of bios at high resolution. The one on the left at the bottom is a scanning electron microscopy image where you can see that this biofilm is indeed composed of tubular structures. The bacteria live inside them. And you also see a twisted stalk. That's another type of iron oxidizing uh, bacteria that can also oxidize ferrous iron to ferric iron. On the right hand side of the image, you can see it's a thin section. It's a transmission electron microscopy image. And what you can see is that the dark material that is coating the cells is actually composed of iron oxides. So what are the bios questions that we have in the projects that are going on in my research group right now? We want to know how natural bios form. And it's not as simple as we thought. There are many factors that can uh, affect the formation of bios. We also want to know how it transforms, um, how bios transform over time. Because bios is a mixture of cells and iron oxides, uh, this mixture acts as a sorbent. So it can by itself immobilize a lot of soluble contaminants. So we need to know if it remains stable over time or if it transforms. In terms of transformation, we've been looking at the microbial reduction of bios by different type of bacteria, they call iron reducing bacteria. We want to understand the key factors that lead to the reduction of those um, minerals. The other question we've been working with is, can we reproduce bios in the lab? So we have worked with inoculum with pure uh, bios, and we have also worked with um, material that mimic the exopolysaccharides of uh, bios. And why, do we care about this? The re main reason is that bios is seen as a very important process in bioremediation, especially in areas that are highly contaminated in arsenic and countries that are extremely poor. Naturally occurring bios or synthetic bios can actually easily be used to immobilize those soluble uh, contaminants. One of the questions that we also are looking at is gamma radiation. When we run experiments in the lab, we tend to sterilize our samples. But now we're finding out that gamma radiation can actually affect the mineralogy of the iron oxides. So we'll have to find eventually another way of sterilizing our samples. 
So as I mentioned, we were able to synthesize biogenic iron oxides by using these diffusion chambers in the, in the lab and just providing a source of ferrous iron to the inoculum. And sure enough, we had iron oxide formation. And this is what it looked like when we looked at it by scanning electron microscopy. So it's very similar to what we see in the natural sample. So students out there, if you're interested in a fourth year project or even a master's, please let me know because we have all sorts of questions that we would like to answer. And if you're curious about bacteria and low temperature geochem, you're more than welcome to contact me. Thanks. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, okay, up next, uh, Brett Walker couldn't make it. He had to. Uh, he had a meeting to attend to. So, one of his graduate students, uh, Sarah Zaydan, is going to present some of the research that uh, their group does. Uh, Sarah, if you uh, share your screen, yeah, yeah. Sure. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, you're good. Okay, hi guys, my name is Sarah Zaydan. I am a graduate student of Professor Brett Walker and we're from the Walker Lab. We focus on marine organic geochemistry and using radiocarbon as a tool to better understand our oceans. So um, we focus on the marine biogeochemistry cycle. It's a complicated and interconnected uh, system. And we focus on a few main components when, which consist of dissolved organic matter and particulate organic matter. And we focus on the broad cycling of these marine carbon reservoirs and also the com complicated interplay between marine microbes and dissolved and uh, particulate organic carbon. So we have a few of the projects that we are focusing on and have a few students under as well as some future directions we hope to go towards. So um, one of the key questions is why is dissolved organic matter so old? So dissolved organic matter persists in the oceans for thousands of years and is able to persist through multiple ocean mixing cycles. So we're hoping to use radiocarbon as a tool to better understand how dissolved organic matter persists and ages with time, as well as contribute to um, dissolved organic matter radiocarbon distributions in the global ocean. Another aspect that we focus on is advanced molecular and isotopic characterization of marine dissolved organic matter and particulate organic matter. So we use a bunch of different tools aside from radiocarbon to analyze these aspects. So for example, we use size fractionation for chemical and isotopic analysis. This includes using uh, scientific instruments such as HPLC and size exclusion chromatography as well as understanding the molecular composition of DOM and POM. So we use instruments such as NMR and mass, spectro mass spectrometry. And by doing so, we hope to understand how the composition of DOM and POM, POM age with time, as well as what compounds are being consumed by microbes and which ones are persisting over time. As well as we take radiocarbon measurements and we analyze them at the AMS here at the University of Ottawa. Another project we're focusing on, of which is actually part of my graduate project, is uh, conducting novelty radiocarbon measurements of dissolved inorganic carbon and quantifying anthropogenic carbon uptake in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, so there are very few radiocarbon measurements that have been taken in the Arctic Ocean, and we have conducted a few measurements there. And by using radiocarbon in DIC, we hope to quantify water mass circulation, quantifying deep water formation, and carbon source and inputs in the Arctic Ocean. As well with climate change and the Arctic Ocean being highly sensitive and warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet, we really want to quantify the amount of anthropogenic carbon being uptaken by the Arctic Ocean. And by using tools such as DIC concentrations and radiocarbon, we hope to quantify this. We use a whole array of different instruments and techniques as well, such as a vacuum line extraction system, which is present in our lab, um, as well as the AMS for radiocarbon measurements. So our field group is known as the radiocarbon distribution and carbon cycling between Baffin Bay and Beaufort Sea, known as rad carbs. So previously before sampling, there were a few samples here taken in the Beaufort Sea, but there was a large gap here in this region of the Arctic Ocean. And being here in Ottawa with the Arctic Ocean to our north and the only AMS in Canada, we really wanted to take advantage of this. So in 2019 of July, we went to Baffin Bay and collected a few samples with Amundsen Science aboard the Amundsen Icebreaker. 
And uh, in 2020, we got funded for a track cruise line through the Canadian Arctic Archipelago to measure a whole array of samples. And this got postponed to this year because of COVID. But you can see we have a lot of samples to analyze and a lot of um, aspects to look into uh, that'll all be related to our project. So here are a few of the field works that we've done. These are all from Baffin Bay in 2019. So we're really lucky to have the Arctic Ocean as our, as our field work, and as well as contribute to the greater understanding of the marine carbon cycle in the Arctic Ocean. So if you have any questions or are interested in joining our group, please contact Brett Walker. His email is listed here as brett.walker at uottawa.ca. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Sarah. All right, up next we have Dr. Bill Arnott. Oh, actually, he, he, uh, oh, there he is. All right, you made it back in. There we are. Yes, we had uh, computer issues. <laughs> Anyways, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Arnott. Um, I am a clastic sedimentologist in the department. I look at sedimentary rocks and sediments. So we're looking at the processes and products of earth surface processes. And one of the, the sedimentary environments that we've been looking at over the last number of years is a deep, is the, uh, is the Earth's deep marine uh, areas. In other words, off continental shelves uh, into the deep oceans and thousands of meters of water. And this is where the largest geomorphic features on Earth exist, larger than the Himalayas. Um, the Bengal fan, 4,000 kilometers long, 1,500 kilometers wide and up to its maximum thickness of 12 kilometers thick. They're enormous features. Um, that transport, that accumulate all the sediment that is created by continental weathering, physical and chemical weathering, first year uh, science there, um, that brings that sediment down to the ocean shoreline, eventually makes its way across the shelf and down into the deep oceans. That's where it goes, building up these large geomorphic features. And so the, the, the scale of these features and the depth of water in the modern system and in the <clears throat> In, the, in, in, in many continental margin systems into the now the, the, the deep subsurface into you know, kilometers beneath the surface, seismic. Seismic is the principal tool. And seismic is fantastic for showing very large scale features, but one of the issues with seismic and, all right, you know, why would we be doing this? Well, one of the end product users of all of this is the petroleum industry. Yes, oil, oil and gas that drives the, <clears throat> the present day, world economy uh, and will be sometime into the future, sadly or, uh, or not, but that is the fact of the matter. And so hydrocarbon production or consumption is only accelerating China even looking, we were just talking about the North, looking at uh, <clears throat> potentially exploring in the Canadian Arctic North and many of those, those fields are in deep water systems. Um, so, So seismic, seismic is great at resolving things at very large scale um, down there in the, in the bottom right hand corner, but the resolution, the vertical resolution of resolving specific features, looking at the plumbing system that exists inside uh, petroleum reservoirs is compromised by <clears throat> the loss of uh, the, the high frequency waves. So what do you do? You go to outcrops. Well, most outcrops are quite small compared to the scale of features <clears throat> that are, um, that uh, the petroleum industry is interested in resolving. So what do you do? Well, you go to large outcrops and there are only a small number of these in the world. And actually some of the best ones, if not the only good ones are in the Southern Canadian Cordillera that we've been working on over the last number of years. This is enormous. We just got lucky and we work on vertically dipping rocks next to north facing glaciers. And so you have these enormous panoramic views of the deep marine uh, system sitting right on the Earth's surface for us to analyze. And so we spend our summers there, uh, July and August, um, in the mountains of uh, <clears throat> just to the west of Jasper and down towards Lake Louise. <clears throat> and uh, um, over the last number of years, there have been, um, this project has been running, there have been over 200 students, most of them from this university, that have participated in this project. And so as geologists, we start with outcrops. That's where our questions start. Well, in order to resolve, in order to answer some of the questions that we have uh, that we develop from outcrop, 
we've used two other approaches as well, experimental and, geochem and geochemistry. Experimental, the very features that, that transport sediment into the deep oceans are very poorly understood. They're enormously powerful. They're incredibly destructive. They're called turbidity currents. And we know very little about them. And one of the principal things that we don't know anything about is the very thing that drives them. And what is that suspended sediment and the effect of sediment concentration, how it's distributed in these currents that allows them to flow for tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers in excess of thousands of kilometers on a horizontal ocean floor. How do you do that? In other words, how is momentum distributed through the current and how does it sustain itself? And so one of the, the only ways of doing that is to be able to peer into these things. And so we've been using a medical quality CT scanner. Um, yes, the things that they put us in looking at density, density, that sediment concentration, the very thing that drives these currents. And so with that, and with a three-dimensional velocity profiler, you've got velocity, you've got density, you've got rho V, MV, momentum. And that is the very thing driving these things. And so we're looking at for the very first time, peering into the very thing, into the guts of these very powerful currents that, that build up these geomorphic features on the ocean floor. Another thing is geochemistry. <clears throat> Here, we're looking at neo-proterozoic rocks in the, in the Western Canadian Cordillera. And the neo-proterozoic was a very, very interesting time of, in geological time. Uh, and shown here are these, um, is a carbon isotope uh, scale. And you can see these enormous, and this is the largest negative excursion in carbon isotope ever in the geological record, minus 13 and sometimes even up to minus 20. This is the global oceans. And very commonly they precede some of these major glaciation, the Sturdian glaciation that, la that lasted for 66 million years. Um, About 30 so, seconds still, sorry. 30 seconds, and so geochemistry. So by looking at both um, inorganic and organic carbon, looking at the um, some of the, 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 the ocean chemistry of ancient oceans. Detrital zircon geochronology for looking at the distribution and the changes in providence that build up these features. And one of the things that we've been getting into um, lately is this very, very common sedimentary structure, planar lamination. Here in our rocks, ancient deep marine rocks, here in the modern Mississippi deep sea fan. And a feature which is ubiquitous these are shallow marine rocks. Here's more planar lamination. Planar lamination, when you look at it at, under the microscope in the upper left, under the scanning electron microscope, you can see this incredible um, uh, segregation of different grain sizes, it's a process that we have absolutely no understanding of how this happens. And in these three examples right here from the upper left to the, to the lower right, you can see Planar stratified in the upper left, very beautifully stratified in the center and rather poorly stratified, but nevertheless, this diffuse stratification here. Well, as it turns out, stratigraphically upward in these cores from where these were taken, and these are CT images of them, you can see that there is a progressive change in the character of this. This is the same grain size. Nothing has changed in the, in the granulometric makeup of these, but the quality of the stratification has. In other words, the processes that create planar stratification. Where's this? Right here. This is Orleans. This is two boreholes from the Champlain Sea that you learned about in first year. In other words, these processes that we're talking about operate in a wide array of different sedimentary environments. And for people who have an environmental bent on things, this is what is controlling groundwater, contaminant flow. This is the container through which um, uh, these, these fluids are going to be migrating. <clears throat> and so as a sedimentary geologist, what do you bring to the table? You bring the framework. You bring the framework to the petroleum companies, you bring them to the environmental companies. That's what sedimentary geology and that is what our group is doing. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right. Uh, next up is Dr. Pascal Laudet. Uh, yeah, thanks, Taylor. Yep. And thanks, uh, everybody for uh, sticking around this late. I'm going to try to be quick. And um, I, uh, at the beginning of the ice one today, Bill mentioned something about people's uh, zoom background. So I was thinking, what can I put as my really nice background? And here's where I was uh, exactly one year ago on March 12. It was March 13 in New Zealand. 
I was uh, halfway up Mount Taranaki, and this is a picture uh, uh, looking out to the Tasman Sea. If you're not familiar with this, uh, here's a Google image. Uh, Mount Taranaki is this little volcano all the way out here. I was in New Zealand to, uh, on sabbatical to uh, make uh, uh, new collaborations with people in Wellington. New Zealand's a fantastic natural laboratory. Uh, you see here the trench. So there's a subduction zone here where the Hikarangi Plateau is subducting beneath New Zealand. And the volcanic heart arc starts around here and goes to the northeast. And there was a really big earthquake last, last week that you might have heard about. So this Mount Taranaki here is, is a little isolated. Uh, and you see this ring of darker green is actually the forest. And so the tree line that you're probably seeing in, in the background there is all that's left of the trees in New Zealand. All these uh, light colored uh, green um, was cut down to make way for sheep. Uh, but anyways, I thought this is a really actually accurate uh, representation of the kinds of things that we do in our group. And I thought I'd take this opportunity to try to come up with a different way to present what we do. And I'm thinking in terms of Venn diagrams these days. So uh, let's go ahead. So my, I'm an earthquake seismologist and I like at tectonic problems. So the bigger uh, set here is problems about earthquakes and tectonics, primarily at subduction zones like uh, New Zealand. Uh, here's an image, a uh, picture of uh, Costa Rica. Similar things happens, uh, happen everywhere around the globe at subduction zones. And we're trying to understand what's giving rise to earthquakes and what's the physical properties of the geological material at those depths where earthquakes are happening. And we can only do this by looking at uh, remote sensing, with using remote sensing techniques such as uh, seismic imaging. So we use the seismograms primarily to understand the earthquakes themselves, but also to use the earthquakes as a source for imaging what's underneath uh, these subduction zones. So that's the, the bigger set. And inside that, what we do, we do some field work and data collection. Uh, this is, uh, marine cruises uh, deploying seismic instruments at the bottom of the sea. This is not, this is not my picture. I've, I haven't been on a cruise yet, but this is what uh, my group will be doing in the, in the future years. I'm part of this national facility for seismic imaging that has the largest fleet of ocean bottom instruments in the world. And we'll be use, starting to use those in the near future. We also do field work on land. This is one seismic station in the Yukon. So I have an array in the Yukon and we collect data this way. And then there's another set where we actually process these data using math and physics. And essentially uh, people here, I, I noticed there's a few people that, in geological data analysis that are attending uh, this Zoom uh, ice one. So you will recognize this is a screen, screen capture from the course. And some figure from uh, my student, uh, Stephen Mosher, doing some um, machine learning uh, process here. So it's an, an intersection between math, physics, and, and data science. So we, we process these data to learn something about the Earth and also. Finally, uh, we spend a lot of time developing computer software, just like uh, Glenn's group was talking about. We're also a bunch of computer nerds, and we like to build these uh, software tools to, um, uh, uh, to, to offer to the community so that it's open source, everybody can use them. Uh, and therefore, um, we actually sit at the intersection of all of this, so the U Ottawa Seismology Group, and if you want to know more about our group um, and about more tectonic questions that we uh, address, you uh, welcome to um, check out this link for our group website, the National Facility for Seismic Imaging for the um, large fleet of ocean bottom seismograms. And here's uh, my current uh, group and uh, hopefully it will grow in the, in the near future. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Pascal. All right, last but not least is uh, Dr. Tom L. Um, you might be muted. I can't. Uh... You're right. I was muted. Sorry about <laughs> <Very> that. <good. laughs> we couldn't see your screen though. So. Yeah. Okay. So thanks. Um, so Tom Al and I am a geochemist hydrogeologist. So the unifying thread here, as it says, is water, mostly groundwater, but I certainly work in in the surface water realm as well. 
And mostly my research has been geared towards protection of water in, in waste management settings. So I've worked for a long time in mining environments, working on geochemical reactions in mine waste products and, and how those reactions can lead to significant contamination in the surrounding environment. So that involves groundwater science, physical hydrogeology, geochemistry, aqueous geochemistry, but also a lot of mineralogy. And I've also been heavily involved for quite a long time now in radioactive waste management. So that's also, again, a groundwater protection issue because worldwide authorities have decided that the best place to store radioactive waste is in the geosphere. So the idea would be to go down deep as pictured in this slide, uh, you know, five to 600 meters at least, and, and get into a, a setting that has low permeability rocks, the water's not moving very readily, diffusion controlled, uh, establish a repository, it's much like an underground mine. And then as it says up here, really the goal is for the surrounding rocks to act as the ultimate barrier against radio radionuclide migration, migration to the surface and biosphere, of course. So the question is, and, and or at least the question that we deal with, and Ian Clark is pretty heavily involved in this as well. So the, the real question for the hydro geochemistry type people is, are the rocks up to the job? Can they protect um, the surface environment from this waste at depth? So one of, the, one of the things that we do most commonly to try and understand that question and, and answer it hopefully is, is to look at the properties of the natural groundwater, usually the chemical properties because the chemical and isotopic properties tell us a lot about the, the history of the groundwater in those settings. So here's an example. This is data from the Michigan Basin in Southwest Ontario and the, the dots represent measurements and Ian's group collected all these measurements. So we're looking at chloride profiles versus depth and O18. And the lines here represent model, model calculations or simulations of how the chemical concentrations or isotopic profiles evolve over time. And so we're trying to run simulations that can match the data, but the simulations run over time for a very long time so that we can predict the evolution of these systems and understand whether or not the subsurface system is stable, stable enough, in fact, to act as a barrier that prevents solute migration to the surface. And the solute migration primarily occurs by diffusion. So we do a lot of work on measuring diffusion and this little animation here is showing an X-ray spectrometry method that we've developed with the help of Sam Morfen here, Gali Hafizian and Charles Cadeau is also involved. So, so these are methods that allow us to measure diffusion processes in experimental settings, watching tracers, watching with the X-rays, watching tracers migrate through rock samples so that we can understand the discrete diffusion properties of, of rocks in the system. And from those X-ray measurements, we get these profiles, profiles of concentration versus distance, which allow us to de determine the solute migration properties that we're interested in. So mine waste geochemistry also, is, as I mentioned, is a major focus. One of the things that we're working on right now is there's a legacy waste issue in, in Yellowknife. Um, 237,000 tons of an issue. It's an arsenic trioxide problem. The mine at Giant has that tonnage of quite soluble arsenic trioxide stored underground in old stopes and chambers. And they now can't let the mine flood because if it floods, this stuff will dissolve and it'll wash right into the neighboring Great Slave Lake. So, so we're working on the problem with, with others and, and our, our way to tackle the problem is to try and transform this arsenic trioxide to a sulfide, which has very low solubility and, in, and it's stable underwater. So if we stored an arsenic sulfide deep in the mine, we could certainly let it flood and, and it would be quite stable and, and safe. 
So that's a, a project that we're working on. And finally, I'll just show you another one, which is kind of at the interface between groundwater and surface water. This, if you've done some snorkeling or scuba diving in lakes, you may have seen, you've certainly seen these freshwater clams. But if you see a feature like this, you may realize, you may not, that this is actually a, a feature that's growing in the lake. These are freshwater ferromanganese concretions. Here's what they look like when they're taken up to the surface and cleaned up. There's a rock in the middle and, and around it, there is a, a rim that has grown just like tree rings grow. And that rim in cross section looks like this. So truly it does look like tree rings. There's all these layers, which are iron manganese layers. And we can date the sequence from the outer rim to the, to the central nucleus. And in this case, we're looking at a total age of about almost 9,000 years, <clears throat> excuse me. So these concretions are as old as the lakes. These, these are just, starting to form as the glaciers have receded. And so there's a lot of information in these and that's what we're starting to tackle. We're, we're starting to do detailed geochemical analyses across these sequences. And from that, we can start to get a lot of information about the environmental history in the region. So, so just as, a, as a, an example here, we're looking at measurements, very detailed laser ablation ICPMS measurements from here to here in segment three. And I'm showing here the calcium and barium concentration variation across that distance. And if we just pay attention to this small region right here, uh, it's, it's a white band, which is very iron rich. And that's, that's actually right here in the profile. What we can see is that at this location in the concretion, there's a crossover. So we see in earlier time, because this is older material, the calcium concentrations were always lower than the barium concentrations. But then at this juncture, there's this crossover and barium, barium is lower, calcium is higher, and it continues that way right to the present. And so, the evidence is stacking up to suggest that this feature represents a, the transformation in the landscape from a tundra type landscape um, to a forested landscape because uh, trees in fact fractionate alkaline earth metals so barium calcium strontium and so on and and they lead to higher higher calcium in the biota and ultimately that finds its way into the lake. And so we believe this transformation records the time of, of transformation of the vegetation status. And didn't have my camera on, so here I am. <laughs> and hopefully Taylor, I didn't go too far over time, but we're at the end. So you were polite enough not to stop me. Oh, that was great. Um... Yeah, thanks, Tom. And uh, thanks to all of our speakers, particularly the ones who stuck it out right till the end. Um, we did have, so we're going to move on now to uh, the post presentation part of things. So I will stop the recording.